Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome everyone to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. And I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. Thank you guys, as always, for tuning in. This week, we've got renowned trainer Calvin Ford and unbeaten 154-pound contender Tim Zhu joining us. Plus, on Toe to Toe, Mike and I will look at the five greatest fights in PBC history. Curious to see what Mike has on his list. Should be fun and stacked. So without further ado, let's just jump right into our first interview you know him as the man behind javante tank davis one of the finest trainers to emerge from baltimore and truly one of the good guys in the sport today mr calvin ford coach calvin first things first we know you're a busy man how have you been oh man i've been great you know health's been good um kids doing good here in baltimore I'm just waiting for next camp and whatnot. You know, had some good wins with my other guys. Just trying to keep the the W's rolling. You mentioned some good wins with your other guys. Um, can you share? Oh, uh, who I have um, the Mons. I mean, um, the Mon um, Nicholson just won a fight at um, Baltimore mm. Live against a good opponent. He was taller than him and whatnot. You know, you know, he had a kidney failure. And um, last camp oh. when we fought um, the kid from out of New York, uh, Bologna. Um, yeah, that was a good fight to stop his um, knockout, which um, running whatnot. You know, he had cramped up real bad because he wasn't putting magnesium in his body to stop him from um, cramping and whatnot. So we deal with that and whatnot. He came back with a real impressive win. And then I had this. I have a young fighter named Marzo. I keep forgetting his last. He had an African name and whatnot. He had a 26 second. Um, First round stoppage. And then I have my partner, Kenny Ellis, daughter, Mayor Ellis, better known as Killer B. She had a um, stoppage. And then I had a new kid, the last of uh, Javon J. Davis and um, Lorenzo Truck and um, oh. Malik Hawkins, the last of those kids that came up with them. He just turned pro. He had a first round stoppage. Yeah, you're a busy man. Yeah, and then the amateurs been doing that thing. You know, we have a lot of amateurs here that I try to keep them busy. You know, I call them my amateurs, my reps. <laughs> Some coaches <laughs> need reps too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Co- Coach, you mentioned uh, Gervonta. Uh, mm-hmm. Is uh, it's Tank closing in on a bout against Rolando Romero? I guess he is. Well, to my understanding, to my understanding, we call that unfinished business. You know, because. Um, they did a lot of um, stuff of uh, promoting that fight, and then all of a sudden, it just the, the bottom fell out. Um, he's been kind of quiet lately. He wasn't real, um, you know. Voice was this camp, uh, you know, talking about maybe when they do the press conference, he might open up again. But to my understanding, um, the sanctioning body had ordered him and Tank to fight against each other. <laughs> is that a, a fight that uh, is personal for Tank? I mean, is he extra motivated for that? Well, it's personal to his fans because he's running his mouth. You know, Tank don't say too much. He show all his action in the ring and whatnot. And, um, you know, so I think Roley got the message to Tank real serious about it. You know, he, he see Tank. He see Tank's demeanor about it, you know. So, you know, we call it unfinished business. Mm. How do you see the fight playing out in the ring? Well, you know, I don't sleep on no opponent. I I prepare Tank for 12 rounds all the time, you know. Um, Roley, he's an unpredictable, awkward fighter and whatnot, you know. So the plan is, you know, to see what he, what he made of. He had enough time to get ready now. <laughs> so he's had no excuses. Coach, you've been with Tank since he was seven years old. At what point Correct. did you realize that he was special? Uh, beating me here to the gym. You know, when you, when you got a kid that's beating you to the gym, I call them gym rats. Hmm. You know, and how bad he wanted, you know, and my son used to talk about him all the time at the dinner table. And uh, when I started working with him and started really noticing him, he was watching me train my national, my first national champion all the time. And he used to just sit there and watch. And when I used to watch him in the ring, what I was teaching him, he took it and ran with it himself. 
So, you know, when I talk to people, uh, when Tank was young, I said Tank was like 40 years old in the ring. That's how big his IQ is. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We've seen him, you know, evolve so much over the years. Where do you believe he's improved the most? Um, just being a um, person, tell you the truth. You know, um, I never um, tell Tank not to do this. Like, you know, we learn from our experience. That's what makes us and builds us to who we're going to be in our um, older years. You know, so right now I'm just still waiting for the three opponents come together. We got the family man. We know Tank, the fighter, and I'm waiting on the businessman to come in place. You know, so. You know, things take time with us. Nobody gave us a manual how to do things, you know, so you take experiences as it comes. Looking back at Tank's last fight, a unanimous decision over Isaac Cruz, there were some who thought Tank didn't look that good and others who believe Tank showed how versatile he is as a fighter. What were your thoughts on that fight? Well, me personally, um, you got to remember, um, Cruz was very awkward because this is the first time Tank going into a fight. He's the little guy. I mean, he's the bigger guy. You know, right. that's just like when you don't see a softball in front of you all the time. You, you have to make the adjustments and stuff. And then um, with Tank um, hand injury, I think he did a beautiful job. You know, you know, he when he came to the corner and said, "My hand," I said, "Yo, look, we signed up for this. Let's get this done." He boxed. Brutal for it, you know, and I watched the fight and shots that he was catching them with, and I seen him through the head, both hands. It wouldn't have lasted that long. Right. Uh, you mentioned the hand. How is the hand now? Is it? Is oh, it the hand recovered? is fine. The hand yeah. is fine. The hand okay. is fine. It's just, you know, when we start putting it through that wriggle, punching, punching every day and whatnot. So, you know, it's fine right now, you know, but we haven't really, 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 really put it through the test. Uh, banging on it a lot. So you're trying to just let that rest, let it take its course. Yeah. Now, people always talk about Tank's power. In your opinion, is his skill set uh, underappreciated? I mean, for example, I thought he, he looked I, I, great I, I, defensively. It is, against, it, it yeah. is because when you see him go against most guys, he he he's he sweet with it. <laughs> You know, I go to I go to tournaments and places. They say, man, little kids holler, man, he's my favorite boxer. You know, he he put on a show like you watching a football game or a basketball game. You're in the late quarters and he come through with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think his skills, aside from pound for pound, I think his his skills are pound for pound. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, there are obviously other notable names at 135, Ryan Garcia, mm -hmm. George Gambosos, Vasily mm -hmm. Lomachenko, Devin Haney. Fans want to see Tank in against all those guys. In your opinion, why do you think those fights haven't happened yet? They, they're going to happen. If you go back and look at all great champions, there's a lot of fights we didn't see right at the beginning of their career. We always see it when it was time to make the moves to chase that um um, what you call it, that legacy, chase that, you know, I forgot the word that they used, yeah, that legacy of who, what made them who they were, who they were, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I was trying to say this at the press conference when I say they got to give Tank his props. Floyd was then, Tank is now. What we are actually seeing, the same work Floyd did in his prime. Mm -hmm. You with me? We seeing him developing to get to them big fights. You with me? Yeah. And they're coming. You know, that them fights can't be denied. It's just based on the individual that's going to take them fights. You know, uh, some of them will outprice themselves. Um, some of them think they should be on the A side. You know, there's a lot of politics with a lot of it, you know. But we know when Tank comes to any town, it's a sellout. Yeah. Now, I'll be honest, I really want to see Tank face uh, Vasily Lomachenko because just because I'm tired of hearing people talking about Tank is, is is dunking him. What would you say to those people who, who do believe that, that Tank was avoiding Lomachenko? Well, that fight is going to happen. Tank said something about it. I've been campaigning on it. Um, um, you got to remember, he's been beat twice now. Yeah. As, as the word Floyd, you've been beat twice. You know, so when people still you know, putting them on that pedal stool and whatnot, um, been dropped in the fight, you know? So when you sit back and look, it's like they put them, they put them on a pedal stool where I don't think he did a lot right now, you know, to be that guy, but he is a good fighter. Can't take that away from, him, you know, 
Um, he had a great amateur background. Came over here with little fights. Ran into a, a, a fighter that was a go-getter. You know, then he turned it around. You know, so when I sit back and look at everything, them fights going to happen because his name is in the mix. His name, there's a billion fighters out here. There's only a few names are mentioned. His name is mentioned. Ryan Garcia is another fighter who gets thrown around as a potential tank opponent. What do you? What's your take on Ryan Garcia? I just want to see him fight right now to make me a believer. You know, in the beginning, when he had his little role, what he was doing, I was like, okay, he he, he had the fan base. People love him. Got the looks. You know, uh, I just knew that was going to happen soon. When especially when he was talking about it, he was boasting it up. So I said to the scene, you know, he's cloud chasing, trying to get numbers again. So. We just have to wait and see who he's going to fight next to see when he's going to get back in the ring. Right. Is there any one fighter in particular that you'd like to see Tank fight face? Well, I want Tank to chase some straps, to tell you the truth. That's why I'm at. You know, I want him to come, come undisputed, all the belts. You know, that's 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 a big uh, goal in my, in my book of looking at Tank and with not him fighting at the MGM like, you know, back in the days when, you know, that was the spot to be fighting at this, this one of the meccas of boxing and whatnot. So, you know, that's what, that's what I'm looking forward to, of fighting for all the straps. So it doesn't matter so much who it is, but just get getting those, collecting those belts. Yeah, collecting all of them, you know, so we can say we had all the belts at one time, you know. But the fight that the people want to see, that's going to come and just based on the heads of B, making them happen with the different networks and all that stuff, trying to put them fights together. Um, you look at Cam Bozzi, he's shopping around. You know, I know one thing I'm going to tell Tank, we ain't going to Australia. They got bugs that kill you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I ain't messing with that one, you know. So He, he hasn't yeah. mentioned Tank at all, though, as a... I mean, not really looked in that direction in terms of making a fight with Tank. No, he haven't, but he sees if he can't do nothing else. That that's his, to tell you the truth, that's his biggest payday. Right, All right. Yeah, him. It's either him or Romo. Romo would take a chance to go where he 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 go to get, you know to get them straps to get the fight with Tank. You know, so it's just all it's like playing chess right now. You know, yeah. so it's yeah. just who's going to make the right chess moves. Yeah. Now, getting back to you, Coach, I mean, you've lived a, a life fit for the big screen. Uh, in fact, we're waiting for the book uh, to come out on your life. And, uh, you know, in general, we've seen so many people fall by the wayside due to the street life. After 10 years in jail, what do you believe was the catalyst for you turning your life around? Um, I think my, my religion and people and the kids here, to tell you the truth, I can't tell a young man to not fly straight and I'm not flying straight and um, my heart is into it. I call this my cross. This is my cross I'm burned because I am giving kids in Baltimore City a hope to actually see that they can make it. And it, it's not in boxing because I have I have kids that's actually uh, journalists. Um, I have a young lady she's teaching school for mental health right now and she was on my podcast and she spoke. I said, girl, you should be on TV. <laughs> you know, um, it's just so much things different that we bring into some of these kids that don't have to have the opportunity to see different things in their life, you know, and um, my partner, Kenny Ellis, always used to tell them sometimes we don't know what they're going through at home. So yeah. we just try to just, when they get here in this gym, we just try to make a difference for them. Are there any uh, of those children in particular that you look at like, wow, this might be the next tank or, or the next Oh man, I got a lot of them in here. <laughs> yeah. I got a lot of them in here. I have a, I have one kid, we call him Junior. Tank gave him some gloves. He looked like Tank. I think that's going to be my first heavyweight from scratch. If wow. life don't change the mm -hmm. path. You know, because we have a lot of good fighters in here. And Kenny used to say, man, I'm going to never um, get on that because I've seen too many times because the streets will swallow him up. Girlfriend will swallow him up. Economics will swallow him up, you know. Um, a lot of things would change the path of that individual, you know, and like the tank situation, he's seen death and he watches tell her, you know, people what was going to happen to him. And he just made his mind and I'm going to keep both of my feet in the gym. Can't have one feet in the gym, one feet in the street. Not going to work. Oh. Oh. What's, um, what's the environment like in Baltimore? How has it changed over the years? Uh, you know, it's definitely changed. Um, uh, because I'm older now, 
I don't see the old heads, but you know what I call the, when yeah. I mean by old heads, I, the, the, the people are just much older. The youngins are not listening to them. Um, like they used to, it was some things you couldn't do in the streets without passing through the older guys, you know, passing through them, you know, it's just, uh, everybody go for what they know and whatnot. Um, and, you know, when you talk about Baltimore City politics and whatnot, there's no connection between the streets and um, downtown, you know. Um, back in the days when we was coming up, you know, you see some of the politicians walk in the neighborhoods, you know who's uh, was in charge of what neighborhood for downtown and whatnot, who you can go to when you got problems. Um, you see some of the churches, they still being transplanted, uh, giving out clothes, giving out food, still doing some things in, our, in the neighborhood. But I think that, you know, if they go to the guys that's in the neighborhood and um, talk to them and, you know, try to make the, you know, all, everybody keeps saying it's their hood. If your, is this your hood? That's what I preach in our area. If it's your hood, take care of your hood, you know, and that yeah. will make the difference to tell you the truth. Yeah. Uh, back to you, uh, you mentioned this, I think, early on, or we mentioned this early on. Everyone, everyone I speak to always talks about you just stay in the gym all the time, always in the gym. What is it that drives you every day to continue doing what you're doing? Well, I took a little rest right now. You know, I had them, like, everybody thought I was leaving, you know, because I get upset with some things that's not going for me to do what I want to do with the kids. And I took a little break for myself because sometimes you get swallowed up and, um, you know, Tank going through his thing, um, my other kids going through their thing. You know, sometimes I have to take a step back and reevaluate what's the next move. My next move has to be my best move. So when I took the step back, I had to, you know, reevaluate what's the plan. So, you know, just working on systems or putting in the gym other than boxing, because I always make this comment, this is bigger than boxing, you know. So um, what makes me stay in the gym is just keep working hard, just keep working hard, just keep working hard, just keep working hard, and just hope that, Somebody see the, the effort that I put in, and put the same effort in what they are trying to do in life. That's great. That, that's a great way to put a close on this, Coach. Again, we know you're one of the busiest guys in the sport, so we appreciate you taking the time to be with us. I appreciate y'all. Thank you. It's time for Mike and I to go toe to toe. One week from now, we will celebrate the seventh anniversary of the launch of Premier Boxing Champions, March seventh. 2015. I don't know if you guys remember all the names that fought on that card from the MGM in Las Vegas, but here are a few. Mario Barrios, Dominic Brazil, Robert Easter Jr., Terrell Garcet, Abner Mares, a co-feature with Adrian Broner and John Molina Jr. And in the main event, Keith Thurman versus Robert Guerrero. What a night that was. So as we celebrate this anniversary, Mike and I would like to share our five greatest fights in PBC history. We've got our list ready and we'll go in ascending order. So Mike, as always, the floor is yours. Okay, real quick, I'll preface this just by saying this was kind of hard because there's been a lot of good fights. So I, sure. I just picked five fights that um, still resonate with me, even uh, sometimes years and years later. So my number five is Brandon Figueroa versus Stephen Fulton. Uh, I like this fight because of the contrast in styles and the fact that one of the guys surprised me with his performance. Fulton is a superb boxer who also fares well when he stands his ground, which I just thought was going to be too much for Figueroa, who I kind of tend to think of as a, a one-dimensional guy. Well, I under underestimated Figueroa once again. He was typically relentless, but it was clever aggression, which allowed him to land a lot more punches than I thought he would. Uh, the result was an evenly matched war, round after round after round. I was just riveted from beginning to end in this fight. Fulton ended up winning a majority decision, which Figueroa disputed, and I understand why. He could have gone either way. Uh, I thought both guys sort of emerged as winners. Fulton proved he could scrape and claw his way to a victory. Uh, and Figueroa showed he could hang with an elite boxer and I just know that the fans just loved all of it. Yeah, I, I certainly loved that fight. And I was expecting a good fight, but I wasn't expecting that. Um, I knew that Figueroa was going to bring it. And I was curious to see how, you know, Fulton would, would counter. Would he just box? But he stood his ground quite a bit, you know. Um, 
Figueroa at times didn't really give him a choice. It was it right. was that kind of fight. Uh, just just a great great back and forth. I do hope the two meet again sometime in the future because you know they're they're two incredible combatants and their styles are just perfect for one another. Well, my number five is it's probably my personal favorite. March third, two thousand eighteen, Brooklyn's Barclays Center. The night Deontay Wilder established himself among the great heavyweights of this era. Uh, Wilder took on hard-hitting Cuban technician Luis King Kong Ortiz in a battle of undefeated big men. The atmosphere was electric, and the fight just didn't disappoint. Sure, the first four rounds were kind of slow pace, but it picked up in the fifth when Wilder dropped Ortiz with his uh, trademark. Uh, dropped Ortiz with his trademark right toward the end of the round, and from that point, it was on. Ortiz hurt Wilder big time the seventh round nearly had him out i was ringside and i remember you know deontay uh, above me covering up against the ropes just eating huge shots and then in the ninth as wilder recovered i mean you could send something electric in the air that you know something magical might happen and the entire arena sensed that there was this chant of wilder wilder well even though ortiz still had the upper uh, hand at that point and then in the 10th round Boom, that counter right hand off the ropes, two knockdowns later, and Wilder was 40 and 0 with 39 knockouts. Just an incredible night at the Barclays. I think I left around like 3 a.m. And of course, New York fashion, I couldn't get an Uber and I had to pay like 100 bucks for a taxi. Uh, but it was a small, small price to pay for an incredible night. Well, you just demonstrated that that fight probably should have been on my list and it's not. Um, I thought about it and uh, now that you just laid it out, I'm thinking it probably should have been on there. That might have been uh, Deontay Wilder's finest moment, surviving yeah. uh, what he yeah. survived to score the, you know, just one of many spectacular knockouts. But, you know, the fact that he survived what he survived and then delivered the, the KO really made that a special performance. So, yeah, I'm not going to forget that fight. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's move on to number four. My uh, number four occurred March 24th, 2019 at one of my favorite venues, the MGM National Harbor in Maryland. Sergey Lipinet stopping Lamont Peterson in the eighth round of a brutal, brutal battle. I mean, this fight was up for grabs when Lipinets ended it in magnificent fashion with some heavy right hands. It was a torrid pace from the opening bell. Both fighters refusing to give an inch and both showing incredible heart. In the end, Lipinitz just had a little too much that night for Peterson, uh, who retired days after that bout. But what a way to go out. Yeah, um, that fight has did resonate with me because it's on my list a little bit higher. So I'll hold off on making my comments about that. <laughs> OK, what's your number four? So my number four is... Uh, Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder won. Um, it's weird that I surprised myself. But that was in uh, December 2018. So I surprised myself by picking this fight uh, because, you know, I was there at Staples Center that night. And for eight plus rounds, there was, believe me, there was nothing special about that fight at all. Uh, Fury was just outboxing Wilder. Then in round nine, just like all hell broke loose. So it was like two fights, but the second one was incredible. Uh, Wilder put Fury down with a flurry of punches in that round, and you thought, okay, he'll finish him now. That's what Wilder does. Well, he didn't. Then in round 11, a right-left combination puts Fury flat on his back. You just knew at that moment, you know, that's it. This fight is over. It wasn't. Fury. Yeah, that, that was round 12, you mean? You said around 11. You're, you're talking about the last round. 11? Right? No, yeah. no, no. You know what? No, no. Round 12. I knew it was round 12. I don't know why. That means the <laughs> last round. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so Fury has, Fury obviously has some crazy recuperative powers because I just thought, like everybody else, I thought he was done. Uh, he manages to get up and finish the fight. So he survives it to hear the final bell and the fight ends in a draw, which sets up, you know, two more fights and what evolved into a classic heavyweight trilogy. So that was the start of it all. Yeah, it sure was. And and who would have known <laughs> that, that, you know, right. going into that fight, what we were we were going to witness. But um it's really glad that those two gave us what they gave us because I feel like this era of heavyweights um deserved it. We needed it. Um and it, it's been a long, long time since we had seen, you know, that kind of uh battle in the heavyweight division. Let's go to uh number three. What you got? Okay, that's Lipinets, uh Peterson. Mm. Um, yeah, what I remember about that fight, it was just an absolute war of attrition. You know, both guys forgot everything they ever learned about defense and just traded punches <laughs> like rock 'em sock 'em robots. Uh, the result was just a crazy back and forth fight, 
it, with both guys taking just tremendous amount of punishment. Uh, I went back and looked at the punch stats. They threw almost 2,000 punches, even though the fight Goodness. didn't even go 10 full rounds. It's crazy. Uh, in the end, Peterson, who was he was actually leading on one of the three cards. He just couldn't take it anymore. He went down, and the, the last round of fight was stopped. Uh, he announced his retirement right then and there, which was an emotional scene because it was in front of his hometown fans, right. if you remember. Uh, that's what you call going out in your shield. That was like a, really an unforgettable fight. Yeah, it was going out. I, I remember uh, his trainer, uh, Barry Hunter, just mercifully uh, you know, throwing the, the towel, towel yeah, yeah. And, and stepping in. It was neat. And I forgot he retired in the ring. I, I For some reason, I thought he retired a day or two later. But right that's there. right, he did. And and yeah. what a what a smart choice. He has not been back. Doesn't look like he's coming back. I hear he's uh, helping fighters train uh, and so forth out in the D.C. area. And, and certainly they can learn a, a lot from him. My, uh, my number three went down September 28th, 2019. Errol Spence versus Showtime Sean Porter in a welterweight unification at the venue for formerly known as the Staples Center in L.A. Just a quick note, number three to number one, really, it depends on how I'm feeling that day. I mean, you could put them in any order. Anyway, this fight, I just had a feeling would be an all-out war. You knew Sean was going to bring it and that Errol wasn't going to back down. I remember sitting and watching and thinking, are these guys... Are they going to be the same after this fight? Because it was rough uh, from beginning to end. Body shots, headshots, combinations, volume punches, everything. These guys just went at it. I remember before the start of the 11th, um, Errol getting up from his stool and he was like listening to the music that was playing through the speakers. And then he just started dancing, you know, while he was waiting for the bell to ring and the crowd went nuts. And I mean, this was in the middle of a war. And then he scored that knockdown. Sean gets up tells Errol, you know, come on, bring it on. Like, like this isn't over. And it wasn't. I mean, they continue to to battle until the final bell. Spence won a split decision. Easily, in my opinion, the best 147-pound unification bout since uh, Leonard Hearns. And again, it could probably be higher on my list. So I'll, I'll just give you my number two, which is Spence Porter. <laughs> uh, and I was fortunate enough to be there at Staples Center for that fight. That's uh, right. Yeah, I thought I thought that the fight was similar to the Marco Antonio Barrera Eric Morales fights in one sense, mm. uh, just the nonstop action at a really high level of skill. So that's that's what sort of stood out for me. Uh, that to me is the ultimate the ultimate fight. Uh, I thought we were going to see Porter be the stalker and Spence use his boxing skills, but Spence crossed us up by you know fighting Porter toe to toe for most of the fight, either by design or an adjustment he made in the sure. fight. You know, either way, it produced it's a hair raising brawl that ended in the split decision for victory. And I don't even have any hair, so it was really <laughs> it was really amazing for me personally. Uh, Spence's ability. To beat Porter at his own game is something that I'll never forget, especially because I think Porter was as prepared as he as he could have been for that fight. He could not have been any better than he was, you know, when he walked into the ring that night. It was just really a special night all the way around. It sure was definitely a, a great, great night. Glad you were there. Glad I was there. That was fun times. My uh, my number two occurred April 7th. 2018 at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, a 154-pound world title unification between WBA champ Arislan De Lara and IBF champ Jared Hurd, another barn burner. Both guys taking turns hurting each other, uh, Hurd coming forward, breaking Lara down, and Lara, ever the boxer as always, but so unafraid, you know, to bite down and, and, and fight back, which he did throughout the fight. I mean, it was anybody's call heading into the 12th and final round as far as who was winning. And then Hurd landed that short left hook in the 12th uh, that dropped Lara and proved to be the difference in a what was just an extremely uh, fun back and forth. Hurd won a split decision and uh, became the unified champion. Yeah, I actually uh, watched some of that fight as I was preparing for to, to make my list uh, for the podcast and it didn't make my list, but it almost did. Yeah. That was, that was another just crazy back and forth fight. I couldn't, I, I, at the time I remember, I couldn't really understand why, why Lara couldn't just, you know, move and outbox him. But I just don't think her, I think Herd was physically just in terms of strength, Strong, so, yeah. so, so superior to Lara, just in that regard that he just couldn't, he just, he had to fight back the way he fought back and it produced just this crazy, crazy yeah. fight that in the end was just like, could have been a draw. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, great, great night. Now, what is your? Are we? Are you at your number two or your number one? I'm curious to see what your number one is. Yeah, I gave uh, you my number two. That was that's right. So, so yeah, I'm at. I'm at. Drum number. roll, please. So you know, honestly, for me, this was this was the easiest part of making this list. Uh, 
uh, Fury Wilder three. Um, I mean, that to me that was a heavyweight classic. You know, regardless of uh, you know platform, it was I think it was an all time classic heavyweight fight. Uh, I figured the third fight between them would look like the second fight. You know, which Fury dominated Wilder. You know, that didn't happen. Uh, Wilder uh, went down in round three, only to get up and put Fury down twice in round four. When it seemed as as if the title would change hands again, which is which was just unbelievably dramatic in that moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Fury, as he does, survived and then put Wilder down in round 10 and finished him off in round 11. Uh, it was one of the most entertaining heavyweight fights. It was most, one of the most entertaining fights, period, that, I, that I've ever seen, regardless, again, regardless of the platform that it was on. Uh, I just thought, you know, Wilder came up short in the end, but the thing that I'll never, ever forget was uh, his determination, his courage in that fight, man, just I could not give the guy more props for what he for what he did that night, even though he didn't have his hand his hand raised. I want to thank both guys for the guts, the determination to give us that kind of war. Again, I'll just never ever forget that fight. Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen that kind of determination in, in a fight before. What Deontay Wilder went through, I mean, because he went through hell, I, you know, eating monster shot after monster shot, and he was just in there. I, I, yeah, he just wouldn't give in. That was a you know incredible night, an insane fight, and easily could make my list and, and place anywhere uh, on my list. It was not on my list, however. My uh, number one was uh, June twenty fifth, two thousand sixteen. Uh, same fighter who uh, kicked off PBC um, leads the pack on my list. I believe this was the fight that uh, that made some, you know, some people out there fearful. I, I remember all the uh, PBC going out of business articles that were written after this fight um, by certain media members. Funny enough, you know, the, the platforms outlasted a few of them, but that's neither here nor there. Let's get back to the fight. June 25th, 2016, Barclays Center, undefeated WBA welterweight champion Keith one-time Thurman against top contender Sean Porter in a CBS headliner. Four million people tuning in, uh, a packed crowd in Brooklyn, and what they saw was hunger, uh, determination, blood, sweat, and tears from two guys who were willing to give it their all in the ring that night. Thurman won a very, very close unanimous decision. I mean, it was 115-113 on all three cards. I remember everyone being split as far as who thought, you know, they they thought won the fight. Barely anything separated these guys. And, you know, you could go back and forth on the rounds because each one, you know, you couldn't tell who won any of, who, any of those rounds. But I believe this fight established Thurman, you know, as the man at 147, we knew he had the skill and the power and he had the the wit, but but this fight showed that he also had the, the guts, the determination, the will to be that guy. And of course, Porter uh, became a two-time champion a couple years later. Yeah, that's another example of a fight that could easily be on, on my list too, uh, for the reason that you just laid out. You know, the fact that these were two young you know, supremely talented welterweights in, you know, in their primes. Uh, that was really a, yeah, that was a special matchup. And I think the fight lived up to the, to the hype. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that was a great fight. I mean, just listen, if you, if you told me come up with five different ones, I could do that <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> completely for the list. But I think we went through a lot of really amazing fights and uh, the, the beautiful thing is that there's more to come. Absolutely. And speaking of more to come, it is time to bring in our next guest. He is one of the hottest fighters in the sport today, a rising star who is ready to make noise on U.S. soil. The son of a legend out to carve out his own legacy, Tim Zhu. Tim, first things first, March 26, you make your U.S. debut against Terrell Gaucher on PBC. How excited are you for this opportunity? Yeah, it's, 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 you know what, it's been a long time in the making. Um, I've been so keen on getting, getting to the States and, and showing off uh, what, I've, what I've got. Um, yeah, this is a, it's a big moment in my career. What can you tell us about Terrell Gaucher? Well, look, I think he's a, he's a real crafty opponent. Um, super skillful. He's, he's, he represented um, America in the, in the Olympic Games. Um, he's fought for world titles. Uh, he's been up there with the best. So, you know, uh, he's going to be uh, one hell of an opponent. Tim, are you going to be training in the U.S. for this fight or in Australia or kind of combination of both? 
Yeah, look, we're we're just sorting out the visa today, actually, and then um, I'm flying straight out of here. Um, I'll be, um, I think, two weeks in in Vegas, uh, doing a bit of work with Dewey Cooper and and seeing what they got, what sparring partners and stuff they got there, um, and then and then we'll be flying straight to Minnesota, Minnesota after. Okay, uh, looking at your styles, how do you expect this fight to play out? Yeah, that's that's the that's the funny thing about boxing. You you never know what's what happens until you get in there. Uh, my style is quite aggressive. Um, I don't look to take a step back, and I and I look to um, to present dominance and and control control the ring and control the fight. So uh, with Terrell, he's a he's a crafty opponent. He's got good counters. He's got super quick hands. Uh, he's got a great uh, great distance. So. Uh, we'll see how the fight plays out. We'll see what happens. Um, if I have to jab and our box, try and outbox him. If I have to brawl, I have to brawl. If I, you know, it's it's all in the making. Who knows? Right. Now, a, a lot of folks have been waiting for you to come to the U.S. and fight some of the world's best here. Why did you decide to make this move now? Uh, look, uh, now that the COVID situation is sort of quiet, quieted down, um, I think it's the time to go. Uh, we did such great things here in Australia with big shows and, you know, like my shows were selling out and we were, we were packing out stadiums and stuff like that, which was quite, quite unreal. But I want to, I want to get out of that comfort zone and, and, and get to get to America and fight the, you know, the big boys. Cause that's where, where that's where it's all at. Are you looking to fight in the U S often? Yeah, hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think um, big time boxing is based in America and, that's where you've got to be if you want to achieve all your dreams. Uh, your fight is scheduled to be broadcast on Showtime. Your father, the legendary Kostetsu, uh, was a regular on Showtime. Was that a factor in your making a decision to appear on that network? Um, no, not, not really, but I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. You know, um, uh, we're, we're, our family name's got a great history behind it with Showtime. So, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty keen on... I'm getting in there and, and fighting under Showtime. Yeah, I'm dating myself, but it was a joy covering your father when he was uh, when he was active. Uh, what a fighter he was! Yeah, he was he was unreal, heavy hands, and you know what? Well, my dad never never really said much. Came in, did his business, and came out. <laughs> yeah, he did his business all right. Uh, do you so you so you remember? Uh, do you remember watching your father fight? Or, and if so, what were your favorite memories? Uh, I remember. Uh, of course, I remember all these fights, um, and definitely would be the number one would be the Zab Judah fight in in at the MGM Grand. I think that was for all the belts, and everyone, a lot of people remember remember what happened that night. Yeah, yeah, yeah we definitely do. Um, my favorite my favorite memory actually of your father was uh, when he was he was known as such a great power puncher. But I remember when he outboxed uh, Ben Tacky. Um, in the amateurs, actually, he was such a beautiful boxer. But I remember when he outboxed Ben Tacky. Mike, I don't know if you remember this, but yeah, after yeah. the fight, after the fight, Ben Tacky said, "You are an incredible warrior. We shall meet again." And Costa, Costa Zoo replied, "I don't think so." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> that, that was hilarious. Um, <laughs> Tim, how did you get into boxing yourself? Oh, look, I, I think it's a, it was brought up upon me. Um, you know, dad, I think it's from the, from the family and, um, it's always something I wanted to do. And, you know, I, I realized and, and saw firsthand the discipline, the, the dedication involved and, uh, growing up with it, it just happened to be a part of me and that's, and that's who I am and what I do. Did your father initially support the decision? What was his reaction when you wanted to get into the sport? Yeah, look, he did support the decision, but he he told me it's going to be hard. It's going to be, you know, it's like it's not all fun and games, which it, which it isn't. You know, it's not fun. Of course, um, it's 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 a hard sport. It's it's the hardest sport in the world. But I enjoy the thrill, the the fun of of punching people in the face and all that. <laughs> Well, that's good. You're supposed to enjoy your work, and it sounds like you do. Uh, not, we sort of have been dancing around this. So you didn't really need to fight to make a living. You could have done anything you wanted, uh, probably. Where does the the hunger to fight come from? In you know, as far as you're concerned. 
Oh, uh, look, I'll, in all honesty, I was, I was never built as a kid. Um, everything I had to do, I had to work for. And okay. um, I think that comes from the my dad's upbringing and, and uh, that type of style, military type style. So, you know, um, everything I, I had to do, I had to earn. And I was never given free rides. So, you know, um, saying that, um, everything I do, I work for hard, um, and I can't imagine doing something else. I'm not, I wasn't going to go, go to the office and, and work on the computers. I'm not, the, I'm not that, I'm not that type of guy. Um, I've always, yeah. I've always loved to punch on growing up. We, we always used to put the gloves on and punch on in the backyard and, you know, punching on was, was part of my life and, and still is now. Yeah. I, I can't imagine see, seeing you sitting at a desk. So I think you nailed that. Um, <laughs> So, so you you face the the high level of world class fighters like Jeff Horn and Dennis Hogan and uh, Takeshi Inoue at an early stage in your career, and you passed those tests and you know, with flying colors. Was the plan always to push you quickly, or did your skills develop faster than any, anyone realized? Oh, uh, look, um, I've always wanted a challenge, and whoever whoever was the best opponent to try bring it out of me was was there, you know, and it all happened in in stages and. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's gone quite well. And I'm, and I believe I'm ready for that next stage and that, that next, um, yeah, again, the, the next world stage. No, we, we've seen a lot of, you know, sons of, of boxers, daughters of boxers, uh, legendary boxers and so forth. And, and there's a, a lot of pressure to live up to the uh, standards established by the father. Do you feel that pressure? Oh, look, there is a, a little bit of pressure. I've always felt that, but um, just because there's more eyes, more um, more people watching, uh, people expect. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I like that pressure. I like to feel that you know you need to you need to dig deep and and find something some find something in yourself. Um, well, my last my last nine fights have been on pay per view here in Australia. You right. know, so pay per view means. That that means like world, world title status where there's cameras and there's the, it's nonstop in your face. Uh, so once I do get to that stage, it's it's nothing out of the ordinary for me. While some people um, go into shock because they're not used to it. That's really interesting. Now, your father isn't your trainer, but I'm guessing you've gotten a lot of tips from him. How much has he helped you in terms of your evolution as a boxer? Oh look, I think in the, I think my dad was a big part of my um, life in the early part and the influence. Uh, but in terms of my career right now, uh, it's all my coach uh, and myself that, that are putting in the work. And uh, my dad obviously does give me some tips, but uh, he's not always physically here. And um, yeah, we we do it all on our own, you know. So yeah, dad dad always tells me one thing, and that's to not get hit and. Easier said than done, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So the 154-pound division is stacked right now. It looks like the top two dogs, Jermel Charlo and Brian Castaño, are going to meet again in a rematch later this spring. What did you think of their first fight? Yeah, it was, it was a cracker of a fight. Um, I believe uh, Castano, Castano edged it. I thought his uh, pressure and his uh, consistent work rate um, and gave him the victory. Got it. Yeah, I'm some a lot of people felt that way. Uh, who do you who do you believe wins the rematch? Um, it depends how Charlo adapts, but I, in my eyes, I see Castano winning again. Not again, but I I feel like he should have won. But I, yeah, I think Castano wins the next one. Interesting. Are Are you targeting the winner? I assume you are. Yeah, well, I'm I'm mandatory for the WBO title, so um, whoever whoever holds that and whoever I have to fight, willing to fight for that title, I'll fight. You know, I don't care who it is, I'll fight anyone. I don't really give a shit. <laughs> now, what is it about Tim Zhu that will enable him to defeat a Jamal Charlo or Brian Castaño at this stage? Um, I think. That's, a, that's an interesting question, um, and I'm and I'm here to prove, you know, these boys they're good. Um, 
but they're, they're, a lot of boxers these days have become businessmen and um, I want to show I'm a, I want to be like an old school throwback fighter and um, they're built in different ways and, and, and that's what I want to intend to prove to them Something just just occurred to me that you know you have a chance to become like one of the greatest fighters ever out of Australia. Do you do you think about that, or is it just too early to think about something like that? Oh look, that that's that's way too early. And to be considered the greatest, um, number one is Dad, and um, I believe Dad will always be number one. If I can if I can be half as good as as what my dad did in his career, um, I'll be sitting in the Hall of Fame as well. So. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot a lot to a lot to achieve before we can start talking about those type of um, recognitions. Okay, well, I threw it out there, something to think about uh, as we go along. Um, you, you appear to be one of the bigger, stronger guys at 154. How long do you plan to stay in the division? Oh, once I once I win the title, um, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But I'll, I'll definitely be moving up to middleweight in the future. Great stuff. Well, obviously, you're a busy man. You got a lot of stuff coming up. So we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. It's been a pleasure. No, I'm not a problem. Thanks. Thanks for chatting with you guys. That's going to do it for this week's show. We want to thank Calvin Ford and Tim Zhu for dropping by. And of course, thank you all for listening. As always, be sure to check back in next week for more boxing talk, more interviews and more back and forth right here on the PBC Podcast.